low income children, children from ethnic minority households are more likely to have lost months of learning compared with other children and less special efforts are made to reorient that, then that education deficit is likely to live with that child for the rest of their schooling and potentially the rest of their labour market experience. Welcome and thank you to today uh, for joining today's edition of, uh, of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Taneo Political Risk Advisory in New York City. Julia Gillard uh, was the 27th Prime Minister of Australia and leader of the Labour Party. To date, she is the only woman to have held uh, to have been Australia's head of government. Um, and among her earlier positions, three portfolios really stand out as highly relevant. Uh, to today's conversation. She served as Minister for Education, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, and Minister for Social Inclusion. Today, she holds uh, enough positions to make me wonder why I feel so busy, um, but among her current roles, she is the chairman uh, of the Wellcome Trust, which is the 29 billion pound uh, Global Health Foundation. She is the chairman of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London. She's the chair of the Global Partnership for Education. And a side note here, Rihanna is the partnership's global ambassador. Um, <laughs> and she's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for Universal Education. You can see a trend here, obviously. Um, so I am pleased uh, to welcome uh, the Honorable Julia Gillard, who joins us today from London. And a special thanks to our mutual colleague, uh, Betsy Cohen, who uh, facilitated today's, uh, today's call. So, uh, Julia, I wanted to start, in, start by, you know, obviously we're going through a very, very unique uh, and unprecedented moment right now um, as the, the world uh, in a very uneven way tries to reemerge uh, from the pandemic economically while also dealing with it uh, from a healthcare perspective. Um, and while that is unprecedented, it is the second time in 12 years that we have had a, a global downturn very fast in the uh, in the economy and the need to put things back together. You were in office, I believe, as deputy prime minister at the time of the global financial crisis and then prime minister in the aftermath of it. So I'm, I'm interested to know what your key takeaways were from that crisis and whether and as you look now at global policymakers, whether those lessons um, are, are being well applied, uh, if you will. On the, on the surface, it does seem like um, there's more burden sharing between fiscal authorities and not simply reliant on monetary policy authorities the way uh, perhaps it was um, after 2008 um, and we're not relying on China to the same degree to, to float the global boat. Um, but at the same time, certain leaders out there are taking an opportunity to rebuild their economies in a different way. Um, so, what are your what are your sort of observations uh, on, on on what's happening now? Uh, thanks, Kevin, and it's great to be with you and to be able to have this conversation. I suppose uh, observation number one is governments learned a lot from the global financial crisis about what is necessary in terms of fiscal stimulus and monetary policy. And on the fiscal side, we certainly learned the lessons about how timely and targeted you need to be to keep economic activity going. Uh, during this crisis, obviously many things are different and the need for income support for so many individuals and businesses has persisted for many months as lockdowns have prevented people plying their ordinary trades. Uh, but I think a lesson that comes out of all of that is uh, whilst the making of the decisions to provide the stimulus they're hard decisions. The even harder decisions are the moment about getting out or the pathway out. And I think much of that still lies uh, in front of policymakers around the world. And it's uh, right now that we're really formulating the decisions around the world as to whether we will come out uh, overheated, underpowered, and we're all or, and the aspirations to rebuild, to build in a different way, to build back better, whether they will be realised. I guess my second observation would be that the uh, global financial crisis 
was characterised by a lot of uh, multilateral engagement. Uh, the G20 certainly came to the fore in the course of that crisis, and I'd pay tribute to my predecessor, Kevin Rudd. Uh, he was right at the centre of uh, you know, bringing the G20 together and leaders acting together to try and uh, save the global economy. Uh, I think in this crisis, uh, whilst there is some cooperation around the world, we are not seeing the depths of it that we need to ultimately end the pandemic by vaccinating right around the world and consequently enabling business and the global economy to get on and do what it needs to do uh, and rebuild. So I am quite concerned that the multilateralism this time round is very thin indeed. It's interesting because I think we've clearly learned that it is far easier to shut down a global economy and a global just-in-time supply chain than it is to restart one. And as all of these discussions are going on uh, and debates within countries and between countries, um, there are some there are clouds out there, right? Whether it is the fact that the pandemic has not been uh, has not been vanquished, as you as you suggest. Uh, vaccine, um, you know, distribution is uneven either by choice or uh, by circumstance. Uh, there's north-south divide, there's east-west divide on all of this. And then, as you suggest, there's a potential of overheating. There's the specter of inflation, um, all of that. What, what's, what's your biggest concern as you see these debates playing, uh, playing out right now? Well, I would start with two underlying conditions concerns and then uh, come to the economy. I mean, number one, my deepest concern is that we are not doing enough to end the pandemic globally. Uh, you know, the scientists tell us and tell us very clearly uh, that we will not have defeated this pandemic until vaccinations are available right around the world. And if we continue to be in a world where there are large numbers of unvaccinated people, then that is kind of begging for the virus to mutate. Uh, and mutations, as we've seen with the Delta virus, can be more contagious. But obviously, the real fear is that one will generate that's capable of vaccine escape, and then we'll be back to square one. Uh, and so, you know, that is deeply concerning. And whilst it was good to see G7 leaders gather here in the United Kingdom, in Cornwall at the coast, uh, and to talk about vaccine and vaccine distribution, actually what was agreed was a very slow start on the task of vaccinating the world. And when you dig down, most of the distribution of the vaccines will be next year, not this year. And so we need to be doing better than that. Uh, and then uh, with my hat on as chair of the Global Partnership for Education, I'm obviously concerned that a health crisis uh, has alongside it an education crisis. But we all know what school closures look and feel like in the US, in Australia, in the UK. Uh, but we are at least in circumstances where we can use all of this technology to maintain educational continuity and we can help children make successful returns to school. Uh, that's not the circumstance in the developing world, and we know from earlier health crises that when schools close, the most marginalised kids, particularly the girls, never make it back. So I'm worried that we not only have the continuing uh, pandemic, but the education crisis alongside it is going to blight uh, the pathways that we want to see to peace and prosperity in many developing countries. It's going to set us back. And so, you know, both of those things in a profound sense then feed into the global economic outlook. If the world is going to divide into vaccinated and unvaccinated zones, that's got economic consequences every which way that you look at it uh, and will be a real constraint on global growth. Uh, and if we look at the medium to longer term, if we are holding countries back from the journey of education and skills development, then that's going to spell, you know, longer periods of poverty, underdevelopment, uh, you know, thin economies, and we all want to break out of that cycle and have a much more uh, cohesive globe uh, where nations are making their way. So this is all a perfect segue and a perfect setup for, I think, what we really want the heart of this conversation to be about. Because clearly, and you've, you've, you've suggested this uh, just now, different groups have uh, had very different experiences throughout the, uh, throughout the pandemic. And 
Um, and we could we could look at every one of these subgroups, um, you know, all day long here. But I want to focus uh, and hone in on on one group that's been a particular focus of your professional life since leaving government government, and that is women. Um, and here, you know, a lot has been made of how disproportionately impacted uh, women in our economy have been as we went into lockdown because of the nature of many of the jobs that they held parenting responsibilities, homeschooling issues, all of those things. And now for many of those exact same reasons, dis disproportionately being affected as we come out of the um, out of the pandemic and out of the lockdowns. Um, so what are your observations here? Is this is what we're talking about in the US and perhaps much of the developed world? Is that true uh, globally? Is it exacerbated in the in the developing world? How and 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 what can we do to sort of smooth out that process? And what are your the organizations you're associated with? Uh, how are your efforts helping on that front? Yeah, sure. Look, I'm happy to uh, talk about all of that. I think we've got to remember that absolutely at the centre, uh, this is a virus that uh, tends to kill more men than women. So we should never forget that. Uh, but as we look at the ripple effects of the virus and the health crisis, I mean, the first ripple effect is that there are huge strains on health services uh, and that health and caring workforce at the patient contact level is disproportionately female. And so the people who have been in the absolute, you know, uh, midst of the storm taking the personal risks are disproportionately women. And I think it's one thing for us to stand on our doorsteps clapping for carers to show our appreciation, which happened very regularly in the United Kingdom, for example. It's another thing to come out of this crisis asking ourselves a set of profound questions about how we undervalue caring work, uh, undervalue women's work. Uh, and then when you get to the, the next you know, bit of it, uh, the various lockdowns, people working from home, domestic labour, domestic violence. Uh, we do know that it's been women that have stepped up particularly to those burdens. My favourite statistic on this is a, a study in the United Kingdom showed that in male-female couples where both work full time, where she is the higher income earner, even in those male-female couples, it's the woman who stepped up more to the extra domestic labour caused by homeschooling and lockdown. So, you know, the analysis that people like to put on this stuff, which is, you know, uh, in many families, the, the male partner would be the bigger income earner. So if someone's working hours have to give way, it makes economic sense for it to be the female partner. That's not what's happening here. This is, you know, just the gender divide, uh, pure and simple. Uh, and uh, then I would say the next rung of this is you know, which jobs have been lost. And we know that the lockdown impacts have disproportionately affected feminised industries, retail, hospitality, uh, travel services and the like. And that does mean when we're talking about fiscal policy that we've got to be a bit more creative than getting out the traditional toolkit because the traditional toolkit is all about uh, infrastructure, construction projects and the like. This is a different time. What I'm hoping though is that there is an upside and the upside is that uh, for those occupations where it is possible to do virtual and remote work, uh, that we take the best of what we're doing now with us in an incredibly thoughtful way, which enables us to diversify working styles, which gives us the prospect of a better home life balance, a better way of working, which will be better for everyone, but given disproportionate domestic burdens, it will be particularly better for women. You know, you've talked a lot about the fiscal impact here, and I'm, and I'm wondering, do you think too much is made, we've seen this in a number of countries, and, and certainly here in the United States, that enhanced unemployment benefits are a disincentive for people to go back to work. But it seems to me that even we've seen examples uh, in Australia, as an example, and I think earlier in 2020 in the US when the first round of un enhanced unemployment benefits came off, that there wasn't actually a rush back to work precisely for so a lot of the reasons you were talking about. There are other elements, whether it's the pandemic, fear of the pandemic, uh, fear of the disease, homeschooling kids and so on, that were actually impediments to going back to work, not just that uh, that there was government largesse disincenting. 
Yeah, look, I think uh, it would be a bit simplistic to just say uh, government payments are creating disincentives, particularly at this stage of where we are in recovery um, in some nations, as we've discussed, not all nations from the pandemic. Uh, what I would say uh, is, uh, you know, firstly, I think we've got to be pretty analytical about what's still holding people back, uh, even if people think to themselves that being at work, you know, perhaps working in a hospitality uh, service, a restaurant or coffee shop or whatever, uh, that they can imagine going and doing that. For many, uh, the need to take public transport potentially over quite long distances, uh, I think still looms very big in people's minds as a fear during the pandemic. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think we've, we've got to be realistic about that. We've also got to be realistic about the uh, quick way in which uh, school arrangements can be disrupted. Uh, this is, uh, you know, true in many parts of the world that there's frequent testing of school children. And if your school suddenly has a case or a cluster of cases, then home the kids go. Uh, and if you're living with, you know, not knowing whether your kids can go to school tomorrow, uh, then resuming work in the normal pattern is obviously a very difficult thing to do. And then when we're talking about the, you know, taper out of um, government support payments. Often governments have layered in uh, disincentives which aren't apparent to the, uh, the, the eye at, at first glance. You think, okay, well, a government payment falls away and then you're back income earning. Uh, but there can be tax and benefit transfer problems in that journey from government payments into work, which can actually mean that the value uh, that is uh, t got from working is a lot less than it might look on the surface. And so uh, there's always the need for quite sophisticated policy making about how uh, transfer payments and other forms of government support relate to what we in Australia would historically refer to as the welfare to work journey. Right. So a lot of focus is, uh, now is on going back to work um, and what that's going to, to look like going forward, um, whether everybody's going back full time, whether there's going to be some sort of hybrid model that, um, that prevails. Um, but just picking up on what you're talking about, it seems to me that the hybrid model to a certain degree is, is a double-edged sword. It is positive in the one sense that it can give uh, employees a lot more flexibility to meet those responsibilities and challenges that you've just been talking about. But at the same time, if you've got a scenario where, well, well the men can go back to the office and women avail themselves of the hybrid model in, in a sense, that men enjoy the privileges of being in the office. The, the proverbial water cooler conversations and so on that lead to new opportunities and career advancement and so on. How are you working with, with corporations and employers um, uh, and others to kind of ensure that, the, that there's that equitable distribution of opportunity then within, uh, within companies? Yeah, it seems to me that almost everybody in the world is trying to figure this out right now and it's a pretty complicated problem. Uh, at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, we are working with a range of businesses and uh, learning from them as well as uh, pointing to our research work about uh, what would best enable the design of work systems that put gender at the centre uh, as we diversify working styles. Uh, I mean, message number one would simply be you've got to be incredibly intentional about it. Otherwise, exactly what you're saying will happen. We'll have a new form of presenteeism. Uh, men will disproportionately go into work. They'll be the one who's at the boss's elbow there for the urgent meetings, very visible and consequently the ones re rewarded come promotion time or red hot training opportunity time or uh, mentor mentorship opportunity time. Uh, so you've got to be incredibly thoughtful about how you're going to do it. That requires businesses to think deeply about what is merit in our context, uh, not a de facto measure of, you know, oh, he's always here, he seems to be busy, but what really is merit uh, in a way that can be measurable and comparable across presenteeism and working from home or working remotely. 
Uh, second, I think we've got to ask ourselves a set of questions about, you know, what is the office for now? Uh, I can't imagine that we're going to go back to working styles where large numbers of people flood into cities on crowded public transport to sit in corrals going like that on their own machine. They might as well do that at home. Uh, and so offices, I think, will become more hubs, more collaboration spaces. And how do you make the promise of that really come true? Uh, and then there's sort of working cultures, and they do have to be set from the top. If the uh, you know big people, the C-suite people, uh, are there working from the office the whole time, then the message is received. That's the best working style. If the C-suite is using the options, then I think that gives permission to others. Uh, so we're still thinking all of this through. Uh, but what we know from earlier studies, pre-pandemic studies on flexible work, that the tone from the top, the objectivity around definitions of merit, uh, the sort of cultural predispositions that you don't allow a shirking from home kind of culture, a dismissive culture uh, towards those who aren't in the office, uh, the uh, making sure that uh, opportunities that can be realised in person can also be realised online, such as mentorship opportunities. Uh, all of these things need to be very deliberately thought through. So for employers, I think this is big businesses, small businesses, everybody. I think this is uh, a time to get creative, but it's also a time of opportunity. I mean, this is going to bust open many talent markets for people. So uh, where you can recruit your best staff from is no longer reliant on those who live within a reasonable uh, transport journey of your office. You can think more flexibly about uh, the recruitment and retention of talent. And in this world, or maybe not this world right now, but generally in our world, uh, where the war for talent is so important, I think that brings in all sorts of new ways of thinking and working. And this typically, though, is, I mean, and listen, we have this discussion, my colleagues and I, all the time on our own behalf, as well as, you know, when we're thinking about our, uh, our clients. Um, but, you know, this is all great for office professionals, but, not so great for support staff, oftentimes disproportionately women as well, right? I mean, receptionists basically must be in the office. A lot of executive assistants maybe have multiple bosses and given who's in the office on any given day, they wind up there five days a week or needing to be there five days, uh, five days a week. And this is not even to mention um, frontline workers, um, service workers, people working in manufacturing and, and, and so on. And so, um, Talk about the deliberate, you're talking about a deliberate intent here on, on the part of employers thinking through this. How about for those who really don't have that same level of optionality uh, in terms of where they conduct their, their work each day? Mm. Look, I think uh, that's absolutely right. And there are jobs that definitely need to be done in person or where uh, even if it's not a mandatory requirement, there will be aspects of the performance of the work that are done better if you're routinely in the office. My sense is that people will still, in so far as possible, be looking for new flexibilities compared with what was before the pandemic. Uh, they might be flexibilities about start and finish times. Uh, they might be flexibilities about, you know, core days in the office and a sense of non-core days when people can optionalise at home. Uh, yes, of course, there will be jobs where, you know, it's going to be fixed hours and people need to be there personally attending. Uh, and, you know, we're never going to get rid of that. Uh, but I think employers are going to see employees of all sorts of occupational grades really valuing flexibility now and being prepared to move employer to get the kind of arrangements they want. Uh, so a deep dialogue around all of this, uh, not uh, dismissing uh, the out of limits of what's possible, I think is really what's required. And one thing that I think should strike us all uh, through this period is some things that we never thought could be done virtually and now being done virtually uh, every day. You know, I have uh, friends who uh, work in the city, as they would say in London, by which they mean the financial uh, industry, uh, including a friend of mine who works on uh, very, very big uh, deals. And the ethos uh, was always, you know, these deals cannot be done unless everybody's in the office. 
uh, working, you know, continuously, uh, eating pizza, uh, you know, getting a nap on the couch for 20 minutes and then getting back up and chugging down 10 cups of coffee and still doing another full day's work. And you know what? They've still done those big deals uh, working like this. So there are different options and possibilities. Sure. Um, I want to I want to talk about women in leadership, but I want to start though by critical looking at a critical component of that, which is the pipeline. And you alluded to this earlier, which is that students of of frankly of all ages, from pre K through university, have had to cope with um, the dislocations of the pandemic. And you know, wealth inequality and the digital divide impacts have been have been quite clear and evident. Uh, but what about the impact on on girls and young and, and young women? Um, we know the importance of the those formative years, pre K, K, first and second grade, in terms of setting the stage. You know, so much can be predicted o over how well children do at those ages. Um, what are you seeing on that front, and how are we ameliorating that? heavier hit to girls and women worldwide? Yeah, this is a, a pressing set of questions too. In, in the developing country context, so the sort of thing that I see through the work of the Global Partnership for Education, uh, what we know uh, from Ebola, for example, is that uh, marginalised girls didn't return to school. Uh, that was more in the adolescent age range where they were at risk of early marriage or being put into uh, child labour. And by that, I mean uh, particularly labour that is generating income for the family unit. So perhaps undertaking domestic duties to free up an adult uh, to go and do an income earning activity, perhaps subsistence agriculture. Uh, so, you know, we are very conscious and the statistics tell us that if we just see the same trends we saw out of Ebola, but upscale them given the size of this crisis, uh, that between 10 and 14 million girls could be lost to education because of child marriage, for example. Uh, and so, uh, you know, right now the Global Partnership for Education has been mobilising, as, as have others, uh, though we've to date done the biggest response. Uh, to try and support educational continuity and get schools in a position where they can, you know, co contact and bring back uh, every child who was in the school before the pandemic struck. Um, now, the outcomes of that, I can't tell you yet, but that is what we're trying to do. Um, in, uh, you know, other contexts, in, including, you know, Australia, the US, the UK and the like, I think that there is going to have to be a lot of thinking done about educational deficits. Certainly the research here in the UK is very clear uh, that uh, the biggest uh, educational losses uh, track pre-existing patterns of inequality. Uh, so low-income children, children from ethnic minority households are more likely to have lost months of learning compared with other children unless special efforts are made to reorient that, then that education deficit is likely to live with that child for the rest of their schooling and potentially the rest of their labour market experience. Uh, we know from earlier downturns that, that people who come of age, and by that I mean enter the workforce, uh, or seek to enter the workforce during a downturn, whether that's as a young apprentice or as a university graduate, uh, that kind of missing that first step on the labour market ladder, uh, that disadvantage can show 10, 12 years later in labour market outcomes. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in this, but I do worry about uh, mental health and, um, you know, for, for children generally, uh, but I particularly wonder whether we'll be able to see the imprint on younger children who um, have missed some of those critical interactions, which are about, you know, the early socialisation, the movement beyond family into mixing with, with other children your own age more generally, the sorts of things that childcare and early learning provide. Uh, but haven't been able to be provided in this pandemic, and you're only, you know, three years old once, four years old once, five years old once. So if you miss it because of long lockdowns, uh, what's the long-term impact of that? I think the question's still out there for us to answer. Yeah, it's uh, based on what you just said. It occurs to me that 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 answer is going to present itself over the course of the next few decades, not in the immediate uh, in the immediate uh, future. Um, so I want to 
maybe pull back a little bit from the, the peculiarities of the pandemic and the immediate uh, economic fallout from all of that and just look and, and look again at the bigger picture. Because I know, you know, you're focused, particularly with your role at King's College on women in leadership. Um, and I think perhaps many in our audience are not necessarily familiar with the particular institute you're associated with there. Maybe you could tell us about um, uh, about your work there, but also sort of the trends in 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 general, irrespective of the interruptions of the pandemic, but the trends that you're you're seeing on this front. Uh, sure, very happy to talk about that. So the Global Institute for Women's Leadership is a research institute, and our mission is to uh, look at the evidence and generate new evidence, new research about how to clear out of the way uh, the barriers to women's leadership. And we are very outwards focused. Our job is to get the evidence into the hands of people who can use it for change. I'm very uh, pleased that we have a sister institute coming on stream at the Australian National University and we're uh, seeking to work with partners around the world. Uh, I, I think uh, when we're talking about women's leadership, we can get a bit beguiled by the stock and forget about the flow. So people are probably thinking to themselves, Oh, but I've seen lots of women leaders during the pandemic and they've done really well, you know, Jacinda Ardern and so many leaders have done so wonderfully and that is undoubtedly true. Uh, but when we uh, pull back from those visible examples and look at the statistics, uh, we are in a situation where fully 70% of countries on earth have never been led by a woman. Only uh, two have been led by three women, Iceland's one and New Zealand's the other. Uh, and in terms of the rate of change, how many more women are we seeing come up into leadership? Well, it's got better, but not by much. Uh, so the global statistics will often now have us at sort of 16, 17 women leading nations. It used to be more like 10, 11, 12. Uh, but, you know, it's not like it's a galloping rate of change uh, that would suggest to us that political uh, empowerment is going to be equalised anytime soon. In fact, the, globe, the World Economic Forum tells us at current rates of change that'll be about 100 years. And then if we look at the corporate sector, if you pull up any of the major stock exchanges and look at the top 100 companies, uh, then you're likely to see the number of female CEOs at around about five or six percent. That's the kind of standard number. And once again, we are not seeing fast rates of change in that. Uh, so the message is we've got a lot more to do if we are to realise, I think, the moral promise as well as the economic promise uh, and leadership promise of gender equality. Uh, when the World Economic Forum you know, comes out each year with its uh, status report and it's still measuring things in centuries before we get there, uh, rather than in numbers of years, then we know that we've really got to get a move on here. Can you unpack that just a little bit? And I think, uh, I think by the way, the last most recent data I saw for the Fortune 500 in the U.S. is um, is eight percent. Um, and um, you know, every conversation uh, on so many elements of corporate policymaking right now uh, comes under the aegis of ESG um, and its subset, or some would argue it's completely separate, but DE and I. Um, and certainly we've kind of gone from, you know, we, 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 have, we are making progress on disclosure, on transparency um, and stated commitment on the part of um, uh, on the part of companies. But we're now truly, as you're sort of suggesting, we're at the action at the real action point. Right. How do we move from and I'm not saying we shouldn't have these metrics. I mean, metrics are, are critical um, uh, to to having the data to support your arguments and put that evidence out there, as you suggest. So how do we move from a lot of box checking to where really getting where we need to go? I mean, this is the I mean, you can make all the policies in you, that you want. But what you're really suggesting is there's a change in the ethos, right? There's a change in the thinking that goes all the way back to early childhood development um to uh creating opportunities and mentorship and you know and just being open um to it and, I, and look and i acknowledge we're talking about eight percent of fortune 500 companies are led by women leadership is much broader than simply the ceo position i get that but what are your what are your thoughts here yeah my uh sense here is i mean most uh you know global businesses big businesses have done 
uh, the the low hanging fruit, you know, and and we thought that, you know, I don't want to be dismissive about what's being done. It's been big and important and necessary, uh, but I think we've got to acknowledge now that it was the low hanging fruit. So, you know, when I, uh, you know, got my law degree uh, 100 years ago when I was young, um, it would have been uh, very common for young female law graduates to go for an interview for an article clerkship or their first job and be met by a panel of five male partners doing the interview. Now, that wouldn't happen anymore. We've, we've dealt with those things. And so we're in this, you know, deeper dive, stickier, harder, more bespoke, more cultural bit of it, where it's very difficult to unpack and to get to the solutions. Uh, what I would say is we've got to think about it, you know, through two lenses. There are structural barriers, usually, that prevent women coming through, particularly given the domestic uh, load, uh, and we still have to do much, much more to change that. And changing that is, at this stage, I think, about changing both how men and women approach work and family life flexibilities. The research is crystal clear that if you op offer work-family flexibilities, and only the women take them, then the women will suffer a career deficit from that. They'll be on the mummy track. Whereas if you offer those flexibilities and men and women take them, then no one actually suffers a career deficit. Uh, and you know, from government policy, for example, Norway and other places, we know when governments step in and do parental leave arrangements, if they do it on the basis that both parents can have a period of leave, but the male partner can't put his period of leave over the female partner. Either he takes it or he loses it. Men do take it, uh, and the research is showing uh, that that affects gender relations within the family. It affects the uh, bonding and care dynamic between the father and the child, and those impacts actually show years later in the life of the child uh, and in the life of the family and who's doing domestic work in the family. So, you know, I think there's a whole set of structural things to think about there. Um, and then there's, you know, the set of stereotyping issues where because we've always lived and worked in a cultural you know, milieu that has uh, gender stereotyping baked in, uh, it's very hard for us to stand back and see it. It's just the air that we breathe, the places that we go, the people that we meet. Uh, but the research time and time again shows us that we are all suckers uh, for falling for charismatic, uh, you know, confident men, we think to ourselves, gee, he looks like a leader, um, even though the research tells us that uh, overconfidence and charisma are not correlated with great leadership outcomes. Uh, we put differential burdens on the shoulders of women. We say, look, you know, a strong man, he looks like he'd be a good leader, whereas of women, we only respond positively to them if they come across as both strong and kind and nurturing and empathetic all at the same time. Uh, you know, research shows very clearly that if you set about a five-person team, you tell them to go and solve a problem, uh, it is not until the team is composed of four women and one men that the, the women will get a fair share of talking time. Or put another way, if there's more than one man, he'll, the men will disproportionately take the talking time. Uh, the other way of fixing that is to tell the team that it's got to make a decision by consensus rather than sort of simply who's the loudest. Uh, so, you know, these, these things are in our very essence about how we see merit and who is doing well, who deserves promotion. It affects politics, it affects business, the law, and the list goes on, the media. Uh, and we uh, need to be grappling with that at real depth now in organisations. You know, where the choke points are, what is the most pressing thing in an organisation will be different from workplace to workplace and uh, industry to industry, but that deep research is what is required. Do you think, and I want to go back to, since we're talking about stereotypes, let's talk about stereotypes here for a moment, right? So a lot was, there were many suggestions over the course of the pandemic that countries that were led by women did better 
on in general than than others. Um, if you mentioned uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, in New Zealand, um, the president of uh, of Taiwan uh, is another example. Um, Prime Minister of Norway. Um, but it also occurs to me that many of these are very small countries, uh, islands in, 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 in many cases, and one where the jury is kind of out or where, there, where there's been, there were positive developments at one point and then apparently not doing as well at other times was the biggest of them all, which was Germany under uh, Angela Merkel, who's doing her valedictory trip through uh, Washington meeting with Biden this week. Um, do you think that there's a, there's something about the quality of female leadership um, at the national level uh, that is that is different? Well, at the moment, we have sort of uh, competing academic studies on this. Everybody's trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and some early research did suggest that even comparing uh, like countries to like countries, so you were controlling for the factors that you've gone to, small islands, that kind of thing, um, that even doing that, countries led by women, uh, were doing uh, better during the pandemic. There's been some later research which has cast some doubt on those findings. Um, you know, so I don't think we quite know yet. I guess I would start the debate at a different point, which is I think we've got to be very careful about saying there is inherently a thing that is a male leadership style and a female leadership style. I mean, this was fashionable a number of years ago. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Apparently our brains are different. Uh, and, you know, neuroscience, modern neuroscience tells us that whilst there's still much more to learn about the brain, uh, most of what is said in this analysis is really nonsense. Um, so, uh, you know, I think to the extent that we can look at our societies and say, male leadership and female leadership, what we're actually seeing is the product of socialisation and the fact that because men and women, boys and girls socialise differently, because we give more permission to men to be self-seeking, to be confident, to be ambitious for self, whereas we only give permission to women if we think that they're kind and empathetic, put the team first, uh, then we're seeing that on display. Where I think that comes down in the pandemic was the female leaders who get to the top and do well are leaders who have managed to combine this sense of strength and empathy. So people think that they've you know, got what it takes to get through the tough times, but they also see in them kindness. And I think they're exactly the traits that have been most valued at this time. We've all wanted to say to ourselves, you know, my leader's got this, you know, my leader's going to get my nation through. We're going to, you know, deal with this pandemic and deal with it well. Um, but I think, you know, many women have brought that extra empathy. And so people have also responded to the fact that she understands I'm really scared. She understands I'm really worried about my family. I really don't like this. I'd hate it when the world is, um, you know, in this level of uncertainty, this is really taking its toll on me. And then she, she gets this. Um, and Jacinda Ardern was wonderful at showing that. Erna Solberg in Norway, the dialogue she did with school kids, you know, they showed that they understood that anxiety. So I do hope we come out of this having some great dialogue about what is the kind of leadership we truly want? And if it is strength and empathy, then let's ask everyone to show it, not just women. Um, on the flip side of the coin, what I think we can certainly say uh, is that the ultra stereotypically masculine style of leadership, the swagger, the bluster, uh, you know, President Trump, uh, certainly President Bolsonaro, uh, that is the style of leadership that has least worked uh, because, you know, the virus isn't interested in your macho. The virus is just going to get on, do what it does. And if you don't respond well because you're too busy swaggering, then it will get on and infect more people. So let me be a little provocative here for one moment. So you're quite right about the effectiveness there. But do you think think, are you open-minded to the notion? I mean, here we are, we're in a world where there are fewer democracies today than there were at the beginning of the century. Um, and even within uh, democracies, there's been a deterioration of democratic institutions. Um, and um, is it just too small of a sample size at this point? Or are you open to the idea that uh, there could be authoritarian 
women leaders uh, out there or even veering toward dictatorship? Oh, look, certainly, and it comes back to my analysis that uh, I don't think there are inherent uh, uh, male or female leadership styles. And I think I, I think this is taking us to an, a really important and perhaps in some ways uncomfortable space. Um, there is a sort of uh, giro, uh, female hero version of feminism, and we see it increasingly on display in popular culture and all the rest of it, uh, which is asking us to uh, venerate uh, women leaders and, you know, of course, you know, the great female figures of history, uh, many of them, their stories are undertold. I want that history told. I want people to learn it. But we have to be really careful that we're not setting up some false construct here, which is we put female leaders on pedestals and then when they do not even something bad, just something human, uh, you know, man, that's a long way to fall. Uh, and and then, you know, we, we shatter the image of female leadership because we've asked for too much. Um, you know, equality is not saying, I'll vote for a bloke who looks vaguely like he could do it, but I'm only going to vote for a woman if she's amazing. You know, that's not equality because, you know, guess what? Foibles are equally distributed between the sexes and the percentage of women who are amazing uh, is always going to be a relatively small one, just as it is for men. Uh, so I don't think we should stereotype and say, you know, it is only men who feel the siren song of uh, uh, autocratic impulses and projecting their will on others. I think human beings can all feel that siren song. Uh, we've, we've given less permission uh, to women to feel it across history because of the socialisation, because of our culture, because of our structures. Uh, but I don't think we should wander around thinking to ourselves, men are natural dictators and women are natural democrats. Um, but we, we, we should uh, be valuing uh, the skills and attributes that are really what we need to see. And if in democracies we're now saying those skills and attributes are about listening, learning, team building, being open to the possibility that you called it wrong and correcting course, uh, and they're less about, you know, uh, bluster, always needing to be seen to be right being stubborn even in the face of evidence that you did call it wrong, uh, relying on your own judgment instead of deferring to or at least nurturing and being advised by a team. You know, if we want that first set of traits, we might say at the moment they are disproportionately held by women, but they're traits that can obviously be held by everyone and we should value in everyone. Sticking with this authoritarian uh, versus democracy divide. Clearly, President Biden um, has focused on this as sort of the the issue of our time, and that the solutions to the big transnational issues, from climate change to uh, society's relationship with technolo technological disruption, um, et cetera, uh, all kind of come under this uh, kind of un under this umbrella. Most evidenced by the nature of the relationship between the United States and China. Most important bilateral relationship of the 21st century. Do you think that that's the right way to kind of pose the issue that's out there right now, number one? And number two, if it is, are you concerned at all, and it's certainly a concern we have in this country, but I think it's true in a lot of other countries as well, that a lot of our A-list talent, men, women, and everything, is, not, is kind of in, in a world of social media, of taking down people, of um, you know, of the wealth divide between the private sector and public service today um, and all of that, our A-list is not being sent into government. Uh, it's not the noble venture that it used to be, whereas China is definitely sending its A-list into Beijing. Um, and so from a competitive perspective, how concerned are you on? And, 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 and do, you, do you agree with the president's posing of the issue? Well, if I, I can start with the second question first and, and, and then come sure. back. Um, on, on the A talent uh, going into uh, government, maybe this is too optimistic of me, but, you know, this is an era where you've got to find the optimism where you can. Um, maybe this is too optimistic of me. 
But I would hope that one of the legacies of the pandemic has been the penny dropping with all of us just how important government is. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of travelling extensively in the US. I've met uh, wonderful people, including many wonderful young people. Obviously, the young people I'm exposed to tend to be the ones who are a little bit interested in politics. Uh, but I would frequently have had conversations where, uh, you know, young people a little bit interested in politics in the US have said to me, but you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go into politics. You know, the best way I can have an impact is, you know, through a not-for-profit, or I could involve myself in Teach for America, or I could, uh, you know, be an entrepreneur who comes up with something that really changes the world and is there, uh, you know, for social impact and social good as well as for profitability. You know, those conversations were so incredibly frequent before the pandemic. I used to go home to Australia a little distressed about it, and I used to try and put the other case and often see that I wasn't being very persuasive. Um, I, would, I would hope that this era has said to those young people, look, you know, all of those things are worthy and, and good use of your life's time, and many, many people should go into them. But if this thing in the middle that we call government isn't working, when push comes to shove, that is the difference between people living and dying. And who wouldn't want to use the best of their talents uh, to be involved in making this thing that matters so much to all of us uh, stronger and more effective than it is now? And I wanted to say that first because it then then brings me to the question, uh, you know, President Biden's framework and is the world uh, divided into a contest between uh, democracy and uh, you know countries that are pursuing other paths, you know, and then it reductionist comes down to the U.S. versus China. Um, I, I guess I would say before we colour the world like that and start lecturing uh, the people on the other side of the divide, you know, part of the onus here is for us all to be absolute poster children for democracy. And a dynamic that is clearly going on in this exchange between China and the US is, uh, you know, the US, uh, you know, standing up for uh, values that it holds dear, and that's fantastic to see. Uh, but obviously, China has got an easy set of retorts based on the Trump era, based on the uh, you know ridiculous claims that the election was stolen, stop the steal, the you know insurrection in the capital. I mean, all of these things are grist to the mill for those who want to say democracies are uh, messy, divisive, hyper partisan. At the end of the day, they don't get things done. So why would you want a system of government like that? So, you know, the US being the strongest democracy it can is, is as much a rejoinder as any analysis uh, pursued in whatever method of China or indeed any other nation that is not democratic. Right. So we have a few minutes left and I cannot uh, have you on here without uh, letting you go with, uh, without asking about uh, Australia um, in the context of all of this, because Obviously, Australia occupies a very unique position in the world. It is one of the key um, uh, Western allies uh, and, a, and an established democracy, uh, but it happens to sit in a very different neighborhood than most of the, uh, the allies do. And, you know, it seems to me a, a, a challenging time uh, for Australia. And I'm wondering how you see things playing out now. On the one hand, I imagine in Australia or Australia's leadership, as with much of uh, the democratic world, uh, there was a, a sigh of relief uh, of a return to sort of normal international behavior on the part of the United States. On the other hand, in the back of your mind has got to be this question of a country that uh, could vote for Trump or Trumpism or even just for the concept of a more nationalistic, more isolationist view, which we have seen out of the United States in decades past. Um, 
to do that again um, in a world that's very rapidly changing. And by the way, the real estate that you occupy is not going to change and the neighborhood is not going to, uh, to change. And you're trying to thread the needle over an increasingly assertive um, uh, China um, and one that's putting forward a different narrative to the one that you're talking about of the championing democracy as an example. So it's a, it's a tough time for Australia in some ways, but is it, or, or is it actually quite clear um, where, you know, how Australia has to play this? Look, I still think there's, uh, you know, a bit of, uh, I'm going to say scar tissue, that might not be the world's best uh, terminology, but uh, a bit of a sore spot from uh, what what happened in the Trump era. And this, um, you know, I this came as a very big surprise to Australians. I mean, Australians follow American politics, you know, lots of people follow American politics. Hillary Clinton was very popular in Australia. Uh, she visited when I was Prime Minister. We went through for a walk in Melbourne. It wasn't announced that we were going for a walk, so there were just ordinary Melbourne people on the streets going about their Sunday business. And to a person, they stopped and applauded Hillary Clinton as she walked by. Let me assure you, they weren't applauding me, their Prime Minister, they were applauding Hillary Clinton. You know, I um, uh, when when the results were coming through uh, for the election in 2016, uh, I mistimed a flight and I unfortunately was on a plane as the critical results were coming through. As the plane landed in Sydney, I put my phone on and it was, you know, increasingly apparent Hillary was going to lose. And, you know, I'm on a plane, a commercial plane, and people are leaning out of their seats, all looking at their phones to call out at me, Julia, Julia, what's 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 going on? Like like what she's going to going to lose? Like you know, I'm literally I'm holding. Mostly, you know, people can't wait to get off planes. They're bashing each other with their uh, carry on luggage to make it out the door. I was literally holding a political seminar on a parked jet because people wanted to try and understand what was happening. So you know, ag against that kind of background, the shock, the concern was deep. Uh, you know, we're a great American ally, whoever leads the United States, we're in for the journey. Uh, and so we made the best of it. But of course, people are relieved to see sort of normal transmission resumed um, and uh, American leadership where you can think through their strategic settings and respond to them. But that doesn't mean that the memory uh, has completely fallen away or that that as we war game the future of Australia, that, that you know, policy analysts, uh, you know, pundits who are trying to war game and read the future would put at zero the risk that that kind of hyperpartisanship comes back. Um, and as, you know, we think about the midterms and the potential for um, Republican um, uh, uh, victories in that, you know, obviously related to uh, voting measures, redistricting as much as anything else. Uh, when we look at who's uh, shaping up for the Republican Party for next time round, uh, a lot of uh, fighting going on to be the holder of the I'm the new Trump ticket. Um, that obviously deeply concerns Australians and makes us worry. You know, we can work with whoever, but we, we also need strategic certainty as we calibrate day by day in a region of the world where what the US thinks and what China thinks is not an academic debate, it's our lived reality. Absolutely. Julia Gillard is the 27th uh, Prime Minister of Australia. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, we very much appreciate it and uh, would love to have you back. There's so many more issues to, uh, to unpack that we barely scratched the surface on. Uh, I want to thank everybody else for joining us today as well. Uh, we will be back for our next uh, show on August the 5th. The topic will be China in the wake of the uh, 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping's um, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping's assertions um, at that uh, at that event. Um, so until then, uh, be well. Uh, have a great weekend. And Julia, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much.